It's my pleasure today to present some of the previous and current activities of the Australian and New Zealand chapter of ACFF. This presentation has four components. Reports on a survey of karyology teaching in Australia and New Zealand. It provides an outline of research grants awarded under ACFF ANZ for community health promotion and an example of one of those successful grants. And finally, we will present a video, short video, which um, was made for the World Carries Free Future Day 2020. The aims of the survey were to identify current teaching in karyology, identify any gaps, and then to make, motivate ongoing improvement for both schools and managers of curriculum. The survey was developed um, and ethics approval gained following data collection and analysis of results. Feedback was given to various heads of programs in the schools, and then the results were published. The survey consisted of 75 questions, exploring details of the course, the format of the curriculum, the numbers of staff, their employment and their ongoing training, and Kerry's diagnosis, recording and detection methods. We had a very good response from both dentistry programs and Bachelor of Oral Health or Dental Therapy programs. However, only 25% of programs identified karyology as a specific discipline. In other courses, it was taught as part of disciplines predominantly restorative conservative dentistry or paediatric dentistry. And only 41% had a written curriculum in karyology. Visual and or tactile detection methods, as well as radiographic interpretation, were used for diagnosis. In particular, right-wing radiographs were used. The ICDAS classification was frequently recommended for caries detection. However, when lesions were identified in the enamel or outer dentine, according to ICDAS, operative intervention was commonly recommended. Respondents identified various reasons to undertake that treatment, including risk status. When considering a lesion, caries risk was an important consideration, as were other factors such as clinical judgment. This slide shows interventions taught for the permanent dentition. A quarter of schools, 25%, taught operative intervention for lesions confined to enamel, with a greater proportion recommending this for high-risk patients, 30%, than low-risk patients, 20%. This trend is even more pronounced when seen for lesions in the outer third of dentine, when operative intervention was more common in high-risk patients. Given that much of the clinical teaching in Australian dental schools is given by part-time or casual faculty, ensuring adequate staff training in modern caries management is critical. However, only half of the programs offered such support and two thirds did not have calibration exercises to ensure consistency in teaching. The survey has identified a key disconnect between the theoretical philosophy and practical application of karyology teaching in Australasia. The didactic component appears to be well taught. However, translation from theory to clinical application is largely supervised by part-time or casual staff who may not um, have ongoing training in modern karyology and its management or have received any calibration with other staff. When karyology teaching is fragmented, it may result in a separation of clinical non-operative and clinical operative approaches. The high value given to operative approaches can accentuate this. The emphasis on quotas for particular pre procedures may mitigate against non-operative management. Despite all respondents indicating that they teach management of early disease centred on lesion arrest and remineralisation, many taught operative intervention at an earlier stage of lesion depth than current evidence supports. These themes have also been found in previous surveys from other regions of the world. 
So in conclusion, despite modern theoretical concepts of karyology being taught in Australia and New Zealand, they do not appear to be fully translated into clinical teaching at the present time. So our recommendations were that for Australia and New Zealand karyology educators, there is a need to develop core karyology curricula, including a written curriculum to inform the teaching and learning of karyology across all disciplines. We need to provide staff education and calibration exercises to align with current theoretical best practice and its translation into clinical caries management to ensure that those clinicians responsible for clinical supervision are not undermining the risk assessment and preventive caries management approach being taught didactically and to ensure that restorative intervention is not overly emphasised later in the curriculum. Thirdly, we need to monitor the clinical application of caries management and bring the spectrum of caries management under a single department or unit within schools. Fourthly, we need curriculum improvement and translational learning in karyology, ultimately leading to the development of a consensus karyology curriculum implemented throughout the dentistry and oral health teaching and learning programs in Australia and New Zealand which we could then monitor with a follow-up survey. The follow-up of this survey to date has been that the results were presented to the Australian Council of Dental Deans. A submission was made in 2020 to the Curriculum Review of the Australian Dental Council. And the good news is that the University of Otago has included karyology as a subject in its new dental curriculum. We need to acknowledge the various people who contributed to this survey and its publication, Colgate Oral Care for its support. Please note that the article reporting on the survey was published in BMC in 2018. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sue Cartwright to speak about our community grants. Oh, thank you, Kay. And hello, everybody. I'd like to talk to you uh, about the Alliance for Cavity Free Future grants that are provided uh, by the Australia and New Zealand chapter of ACFF each year. These are proudly supported by Colgate. So just a little bit of background. We provide um, up to five grants each year. So they can be for any, anything between $2,000 and $20,000. Um, but the total amount that is provided is $50,000 per year. And we've had a great variety of research projects. Um, we started in 2015, um, the projects were implemented, the first projects were implemented in 2015. Um, so we've had 27 projects so far. And if you'd like to see information about these projects, you can go to our chapter page on the Alliance for Cavity Free Future website. Um, and just go to the grants um, page. The link is at the bottom of this slide if you if you wanted to go and have a look. Um, so in there are, is information about each of these grants um, and some links to materials that have been produced as well. So what are we looking for in the projects? Well, we want to see projects that can help to improve the attitudes, knowledge and environment related to the prevention of dental caries in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we're looking for projects that are innovative as well, um, especially those that involve um, the community, but we also support um, upstream approaches and policy development. And the communities that we're looking to support are those with high needs, so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia, Maori and Pacific Island peoples in New Zealand, uh, people living in regional and remote areas, those who are socially disadvantaged, um, or those who have special healthcare needs. Um, and the projects must also be measurable and accessible against objectives and sustainable. So if you go to the grants page, you will see, as I've said, the projects that are listed. I've just selected a few here to give you a flavor of the types of projects that um, have been conducted to date. Uh, so the first one here is a dietary analysis and nutritional counseling for caries prevention by dental practitioners. Uh, and I know that dental practitioners 
um, may not always feel confident to provide this kind of counselling. And so the materials here can help with that. Uh, we've had a project looking at um, developing a toolkit for integrating toothbrushing programs into school breakfast um, programs. So in um, Victoria, Dental Health Services Victoria um, have had the Red Cross assist with providing um, breakfasts for children in areas of need. And to be able to integrate a toothbrushing program with this as well is fantastic for getting habits established um, with young children. We've had a national survey exploring oral health promotion in Australian community pharmacies. And you know, as we know, pharmacists can get asked quite often for information about oral health issues, but they might not always feel qualified to give responses since they may not have had uh, that as part of their training. So this, this was a great project. We've also had um, a project looking at better oral health and residential care. So again, a great area of need. And then following my few slides, we'll have um, a presentation from Dr. Kylie Gwynn, who's a senior lecturer at Macquarie University. Um, she works in the Department of Health Sciences um, and Global Indigenous Futures. So she's gonna to talk to you about a water project that has been conducted with some support from our chapter. But just before I finish, um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about oral health promotion because our chapter has also been very active particularly around World Cavity Free Future Day. Um, we have had a Choose Water campaign for a number of years that um, reached millions of people, but also uh, won an award. And then last year, we had a video submission from one of our members um, who um, won, a, won an award also. And we will play that video for you at the end of the entire presentation. It's just a nice way to finish. So um, that was in the Smiles for Life campaign, which was the World Cavity Free Future Day campaign in 2020. So the author of um, the video, uh, Lindy Sank, is a dietitian at Sydney Dental Hospital. And she has taken the concept from the video and expanded it into a book called The Mouth House. Um, she's used this concept with her patients over many years um, because it's a concept that seems to resonate really well, that your teeth are living in a house that you need to keep clean and, and look after. Um, and she works with a lot of um, children um, in the paediatric department who have potentially have special needs or language barriers, and this concept seems to resonate with them. Um, and over this last period of COVID restrictions, um, she has converted this, this video and story and concept into a book because this has helped her work with patients via telehealth. So she finds it easier to promote this, this um, concept via a book um, when she can't be face to face with the patients. Um, and she is happy for you to view the resource and share with your patients if you'd like to. So um, she'll provide you with a link if you wanted to ask her about that. You just need to email her at lindy.sank at health.nsw.gov.au. So thank you so much. Uh, that's my part of the presentation. I'd now like to hand on to Dr. Kylie Gwynn, who will talk to you about the Water Project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sue. Um, my name is Kylie Gwynn from Macquarie University, and today I'm going to be talking about our remote drinking water project. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that in Australia, we meet on the lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, Macquarie University uh, is situated on the lands of the Wadamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, it's just such a pleasure to present our remote water project here today. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge the tremendous support of the partners on this project, as you can see on the slide here. So this project um, began when we uh, were working with some communities in the central north of New South Wales. And um, there was a whole lot of blaming and shaming of parents and other adults about the consumption of um, sugar sweetened beverages by children within the community. And we thought, well, let's find out why kids are drinking so much soft drink. And it turns out that the cheapest cold drink in the communities that we were working in were soft drinks. 
and that there was no community drinking water and certainly no um, refrigerated or palatable drinking water. So the problem, of course, is that there's no cold, um, yummy water for kids to drink and the temperature's up over 30 degrees. Um, children will understandably uh, drink whatever's available. And so that then, of course, if kids are drinking a lot of sugar, sweetened beverages, can lead to tooth decay and obesity, obviously um, compounds things like chronic disease, has an impact um, on the environment. And so it's a problem worth fixing. So um, we did some work with three small communities to work out how we could install refrigerated water fountains. And over a period of time, working with the local Aboriginal Land Council and the community, we installed some refrigerated water fountains, refillable water bottles. Um, we got the school involved and they did some lovely work with the kids around filling up their drinking uh, drink bottles each morning and sipping from that throughout the day and obviously um, having a community education program. And so that seems all pretty straightforward, as you can imagine. So if we did it in three places, why not do it everywhere? Easy. <laughs> so um, we know that it will work because that little program we did a few years ago was in uh, just a, a three small schools and that most kids went from drinking lots and lots of sugar sweetened beverages and some never drinking water to most kids drinking water every day. And so it's certainly not rocket science that if there's cold, yummy water available, then children will drink it. Obviously, if kids have access to cold drinking water, it's much healthier for them and has a whole range of positive benefits. So we thought, well, let's find out what can be done um, across Australia. What's the scope of the problem and how do we tackle this? If we can tackle it in three places, surely we can tackle it everywhere. So we've just completed um, a, a national survey where we found that there's 222 communities around Australia that don't have access to community drinking water. And we think, well, 222, that's a problem we can solve. And in fact, there's only eight in New South Wales. So um, a very fixable problem here. So our plan for this project is to work with local Aboriginal land councils and local government to identify the right locations for the water fountains and to work with them to install them. It will supply five years of filters so that we reduce the ongoing costs in the medium term and we'll put in place some water flow meters so that we know we can track the consumption of water over time. Obviously, we'll um, work with the communities to make sure that there's lots of opportunities to reinforce drinking water and formally hand over ownership of each water fountain to the governing body locally, whether that's the Aboriginal Land Council or local government, so that that ongoing maintenance and repair is managed locally where it should be. All right, um, so what do we need? Well, we, um, we want to install refrigerated water fountains in 222 um, communities across Australia, and we're working with funders to get this done. Of course, we're very proud to partner with the Alliance for a Cavity Free Future, who are funding two of these fountains, and that despite delays um, as a result of the pandemic, we're working with um, communities to get this, um, get it done in those two places. So thank you very much to the Alliance. We have amazing ambassadors on this project. We have Professor Tom Kalmar, who is providing some extraordinary policy leadership for us. We have Bunjalung Elder Bo Rambaldini, who is um, supporting the direct connections with community and making sure that this work is done in a culturally safe way. And um, Dr Chris Burke, who was the first um, Aboriginal dentist trained in Australia and has been a, a tremendous lead for all of us in our wider work around oral health, uh, including this, this water project. And if anyone um, has any questions about this, please uh, contact me that we, uh, we think that uh, installing 222 water fountains around Australia into communities that are the most disadvantaged and most remote will have a tremendous impact immediately on children's 
feeling of well-being and obviously tooth decay, but in the longer term, it will have a massive impact on chronic disease. So if anyone's got any great ideas or knows some ways to help get this job done, we'd really welcome contact. We'd like to finish our presentation today by playing the video Sue referred to earlier. Um, it was the winner of last year's World Cavity Free Future Day Smiles for Life competition. Um, we hope you've really enjoyed our presentation today uh, and we wish you all good health. Mouth is a place that we need to tend from the start of life to the very end. Our home for teeth to stay safe and strong. To eat, to talk, to sing a song. Protect your mouth at every stage and keep your smile as you age. Smile for life.